Hello and welcome to the latest Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. This week we're actually at Convex in the stunning Scalpel building in the heart of London's financial district to meet 26-year-old Eid al Jazeli, who's doing an internship here. Eid is a Syrian refugee who fled the devastating war in his home country, forced to leave his family behind. When he arrived in the UK three years ago, after a terrifying journey, which he came close to not surviving, he spoke no English and lived on the streets, sometimes going hungry. Now, finally granted refugee status, he's planning to study accounting and finance at university and is training for next year's Tokyo Olympics as a swimmer. Pretty remarkable for a non-swimmer who almost drowned at sea as he tried to escape. His story of survival at the hands of smugglers, travelling with a fake passport and papers, and unsure who to trust with his hard-gotten cash, is both remarkable and humbling, and one nobody should have to endure. So let's say a very big hello to Eid. Oh, hey there. Thank you so much for having me. What an introduction that is, Eid. What a life you've lived so far. And here we are in one of the city's great businesses and skyscrapers. How does it feel to be at the heart of London's financial district, beginning to live your dream? For me, this is like just a big dream just to be here and imagining myself like having this experience with this company and these people. Because I remember since I was in in Syria and studying accounting and finance and just look at the big companies around the world and see how they are working and everything so when i arrived to the uk like i remember like walking around liverpool street and looking to this big building with the glasses and this huge buildings it's just like i'm just like i remember like i was standing next to building and i'm just like looking to it and like oh my god this is real i can't even believe how i'm just like there and just to see this big building with the glasses and the reflection of the other buildings around, it just like I was just talking to myself and see like I have no idea what is inside, but this is real and one day I'm gonna make it in, in there. I wanna be the CEO of the building, I wanna be studying there and make my dreams become true and here we go. You're an intern here at Convex and your journey, your physical journey of how you actually got to the UK is remarkable. But before we hear about that, can you paint a picture for us, Eid, of what life was like in war-torn Syria for you? So our life in Syria was like very happy life. We have a normal life. Everything was peaceful and everything was great. I mean, I had like a great university in Syria. I was studying accounting and finance, having a family, having friends. I was working as a visual merchandiser at the same time and everything was great. And suddenly in one second, like everything has to change just because of the war and the situation and just like had to leave just because of the situation there. What was it actually like? What was day to day life like for you and your parents and your siblings once the war broke out? I think when it just started in Syria, the situation was really terrifying for everybody. I mean, like, wherever you go, there is no safe for anybody. And I remember, like, just sitting, having my lecture at the university, it's just like, we can hear all the bombing just going above of our hate. And uh, just like, wherever you go, you keep hearing, like, bombing, a lot of fighting and it was like really complicated and it, it wasn't safe at all. Like whatever you go, whatever you do. And were your family frightened too? So yeah, we are at home, especially my mom. She was really worried about us as we are six, four boys and two girls. Like everybody like gonna leave the house. Like she's gonna call me, leave everything and come back home. And I remember like, mom, I have an exam. Just let me do it and come back. And she said, please leave. It's very dangerous. Any random bomb, if it will go somewhere it will kill everybody and I remember like also my university there was a period of time where like they bombed the university and like the first floor already gone and like lots of injured a lot of professors already died so it's it's pretty scary. Where were you based? Were you Damascus? I was born in Damascus and the university I'm studying in in Damascus as well. And what's your home like? And are you in in the sort of centre of Damascus or on the outskirts? So we I do live in the central of Damascus, like we live, like literally, it's like I'm in London, like 20 minute walking to Oxford Circus or something. 
So we had just beautiful country, everything very nice. I mean, our culture is really great. We have the love, we have looking after each other. And it's just like very simple. So what was the tipping point, Eid, when you decided this is it, I need to get out and I need to flee? Because I'm sure that was a very big decision for you to make. Exactly. So I think for me it was a little bit complicated because I was in the second year of my university and I tried so hard just to stay there and keep studying and try to go to university, go to my work, stay safe, stay away from everything. But every single day, like I leave the house, I am in danger. I mean, I've lost a lot of friends, lots of friends of my family as well. And every single day, like I leave my mom just crying and like, she said, please, it's not safe for you, especially for young people, like because of the military and all this situation. And also like when I go to work, it's not really safe. Whatever you do, it's like there is no safe at all. And in the end of all that, I had to leave because I think it's better for me and better for everybody just to be safe. And I had to leave the country at that time. The day you left, was it very emotional saying goodbye to particularly mum, perhaps, and obviously your brothers and sisters and your father? Because one would imagine you might not know when you'll see them again. So for me, it was really sad at that time because just to leave Syria, you can't really go back there because anybody will leave with not a proper way, just going to be not safe at all. And just, I remember like just saying goodbye to my family. It was like really, re really hard just to look at my mom and my dad and my brothers and sister and just tell them goodbye. It was like really, really hard for me just to leave everything behind me and just go by myself, try to find a good place just to stay in and be safe. And of course, a journey like you made, it's not like booking a holiday. You have to find a smuggler you have to find somebody who's going to help you you're fleeing it's escape isn't it so what was that like and and how did you find somebody to help you so it was very complicated but i mean people when they are leaving you just have to leave to turkey but the first step like we had to leave like fr from syria to lebanon like we went there like by car and after that i had to go to turkey and from turkey is all the journey gonna start so basically, you have just to try to find a smuggler to get out from, from Turkey. And uh, the only way to get out from there, you have to find a smuggler and leave by boat or a digni. And when I arrived there, it took me a bit of time just to understand how to find the smuggler, how to leave from there, how much it's going to cost. And it was a bit hard. But in the end, like I found a smuggler and he told me it's going to cost you around like a thousand, maybe two hundred dollar. Or something like that and it, it will be like in a small boat and it will take you to the other side of Turkey and you will be arriving in Greece and just a $1,300 in Syria it costs a lot of money like the normal salaries like for people who work there probably they might get like 50 to 100 dollar a month so imagine just to get a thousand three hundred just to give it to smugglers to take you from Turkey to Greece and so that's probably the equivalent of around two years' salary. And also, presumably, you're giving it to somebody who you have no idea whether you can actually trust. Exactly. Because in the end of the day, it's a smuggler. He's just like standing in the streets. He might tell you, oh, you're going to leave it here. Everything's going to be fine. If something happened, just give us a call in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the ocean. And... Uh, just let me know like you stuck or something and we're just gonna help you and get back and I remember paying him the money like I knew 100% like I'm not gonna see this guy anymore and actually that's what happened exactly so they don't come with you uh, no it doesn't work like that they just gonna try to collect maybe 40 people 30 people take you like to a wood area or like a small village like very near to the sea or to the ocean from there and they're just gonna put the people in there and they're just gonna see if there is anybody will volunteer and to drive the boat. So the guy who's gonna drive, he doesn't have to pay anything. And the smuggler, he's just gonna go jump with him in the boat. They are just gonna teach him like for five minutes how to drive. And it's really hard. It's so complicated because you have to hold the motor like in the opposite way. Like if you want to go to the right, you have to take it to the left. 
and if you want to go straight you have to put it back it's just like it's so dangerous at the same time there is people with you like more than 30 or 40 people children kids i mean mothers and fathers and like it's just crazy and presumably all frightened because you'd be a lot in a lot of trouble i'm guessing if you were caught leaving that way you don't know what's gonna happen i mean next i mean since you're gonna be on the boat whatever gonna happen to you if you're gonna sink if you're gonna arrive if you're not gonna arrive you are the responsible about yourself i mean nobody gonna find out anything what is gonna happen to you your boat was a small boat wasn't it and yeah. tell us a bit about the journey because the boat didn't do very well on the journey did it actually the journey wasn't really a good journey for me good experience so the boat we had to take it was like very small boat it's like a wood boat the one you just take for the adventure i don't know what do they really call it but we were around probably like 20 people more or less and i remember like after driving maybe like for an hour hour and a half the motor just stopped and we tried again and again and again and it's just like not working we tried to call and reach with a smuggler and the other people who held the smuggler to control like everything and we didn't have any network and we are in the middle of nowhere and i remember like after we were trying like for 30 minutes it was like 3 or 4 a.m and i remember like every single wave hitting the boat like we are jumping three four meters like in the air and hitting back in the water and and the boat, like, it's just like a piece of food and keep cracking and broken, like, piece by piece. And in the end, it just, the boat broke and we sank in the water for maybe around two hours. And at that time, like, I wasn't able to swim. I couldn't see, like, all the people who was on the boat, like, if they're still around. And we stayed, like, in the water around two hours. But thank God for safety. In the end, I just, like a huge ship from the Turkish police. They just like found us in the middle of nowhere. They grabbed us from the water. They drove us back to Turkey. They was in prison like for one day. We had some food and warm clothes and they told us just we don't have to do that again. But that's what happened. What went through your mind when you were in the water? I remember like the first things when the motor stopped, I thought it's gonna work again. No, this is impossible. Like, like after all that happened, like in Syria, like, Am I really going to die in the sea? Am I really going to die in nowhere? Like, what about my family? What about my dad, my sister, my mom, my brothers? Like, everything went in my head and I couldn't really handle it. I remember, like, when the boat started breaking, I was anxious and I can't feel anything what is going on. And just like when I open my eyes, I remember, like, I am in the water holding the piece of food and the police and the lights in my face and everything was really terrifying at that moment. So when you arrived in Turkey and you said you went to prison for a night and you were given food and warm clothes, were people kind to you at that point? Did they understand what you were trying to do? So actually at that time, yeah, they were like very nice to us, very friendly. They just, because like there's thousands or if it's not even millions of people who really want just to leave and be safe. And it's not only from Syria. I think from all around the world, like I've met a lot of people just trying just to escape and they, they know the situation. They know like people trying to leave from there. So they just like basically treat us very well. And they just said, sign on this paper that you don't really have to do it again because you're going to be arrested, etc. But at that point, you have to leave. You have to try again and again. And yeah, so after that, actually, I've lost my money and I couldn't really make it. And I had just to work, try to get, again, some more money just to find a smuggler. And weeks later, I found another smuggler. He gave us like the same price, but at the same time, it was just like a bigger boat. We were like around 35 people or 40, I can't really remember. The journey was, it was safe. It was really successful. I mean, we took the boat again. It was a balloon one. The journey took us around like three, four hours. And we just like made it in the end. We arrived to Greece and the journey was fine. And what happened when you got to Greece? So when I arrived to Greece, the situation was a bit complicated because the border was closed and nobody can leave from there. But after that, like you can't really stay in Greece because you are just like 
on the board and sitting nowhere and you can't do anything. So I just had to continue my journey. So I had to search and find to another smuggler. And after a while of searching, I found another smuggler who gave me just two options. Told me like you can basically leave to the US or like you can just leave to United Kingdom. And he said like to the US, maybe you have to pay like 10 grand or to England, maybe to pay like six or seven grand. But how did you do that? Because you hadn't got any money at that point. Exactly. So at that point, like, it just like, no way, like, I can't really pay all that money because in Syria, maybe with this money, you can maybe buy a house or something. And uh, it's just like, I try to see how much money I have left or anything, but he's asking for a huge amount of money, which is impossible. So I had just to speak to my family, mom and dad, explain the situation. And also for them, like, oh my God, this is impossible. But a few months later, my mom had to sell her gallery and my dad just sold his car, borrowed some money from his friend and here and here. And in the end, like, I got the money. But again, you're handing over your parents' sort of life savings, if you like, not really sure as to whether it's gonna work out. I mean, it did work out and you managed to get to Scotland but did you feel anxious again and nervous that here you are handing over, you know, money that your mum sold her jewellery, dad sold the car? It must have been quite worrying, I would have thought. Of course it is. I mean, if I just think about it, like whatever I'm doing, you can't really trust anyone on your journey. I mean, in very simple things like the smuggler just can't take the money and disappear and like nothing going to happen. But if you were like in this situation, you don't have a lot of options. Like this is the deal. I remember like the smuggler saying, okay, like if you want to come and do the passport and all the, this type of things, this is how much it's going to cost. If you don't want to do that, just, oh, good luck, stay in the tent. And he said, oh, this is my job. I've, I've been here like eight, nine years and I don't really care. There is a lot of people like will fly. So I try to try to search and try to find a good smuggler. But at the end of the day, it's all of them smugglers like, you can't really trust any of them. No, I don't suppose there's a, well, I suppose there are good smugglers, but it sounds quite funny when you yeah, say you were exactly. looking for a good smuggler. And you found a good smuggler who, who created a new identity for you. I mean, exactly. you travelled on a, on a fake passport, didn't exactly. you? As Martin from... Yeah, so I was uh, Martin from Rotterdam. And I remember like when he made that passport, we had to fly from different places like Greece, Belgium, Spain... Ibiza, etc. And I arrived in the end to Scotland. So I remember by having the interview with the home office, I wasn't even able to speak English at that time. And I was telling my translator, like, after like a few hours, like, I'm really hungry. Is it possible just to go to central London just to have some food and come back? And they were all of them laughing at me. And they said, you are at Scotland. And they said, like, where is it? I'm not really good at the ge geography. And they said, actually Scotland like it's eight nine hours away from London like where did the smuggler send me am I in the UK or where am I but yeah in the end of all that like I arrived to Scotland it was a bit tough it was really complicated but I mean since I arrived to the UK like I feel I am safe despite all that like I feel like safe. You are so positive about your story because we spoke before this interview and you said life in Scotland was a bit tough. It wasn't really a bit tough, was it, Ed? I mean, it was really tough because you were homeless at some points. Sometimes you didn't have enough food. I know you're really humble about it, but it wasn't easy, was it, living rough in Scotland? So it was a bit complicated when just arriving at Scotland and applying for asylum seeker and being a refugee. And it, it took us a while until we just, like, get the papers from the home office and everything and uh, it was actually really tough really tough it, it was like really bad experience in my life but maybe after like this two months of being homeless and being around in Scotland and Glasgow uh, I think our application with the home office has been accepted and I remember like I stayed in a hostel like for a while and after that they just like transfer me to London. It's like around Chadwell Heath, I don't know, like Zone 5 or 6. And here like I had to wait there for around a year, a year and a bit. Because when you arrive to the UK as a refugee, you can't work, you can't study, you can't do anything until you're going to get your paper. And it took me around a year and a bit and after that I've got a refugee status. 
and I can study, I can work and I just like can't have a normal life. Because also as well, I think you were trying when you came to London, you were trying to live on five pounds a day, weren't you? Which, yeah. which doesn't go very far, does it, when you're here? Yeah. Actually, it is a bit tough. It's a really hard. But at the same time, I'm so thankful and appreciate everything, you know, like without this small support from the home office, like I can't be even living, you know. But with this five pounds, I just like try to manage just to buy something, try to cook at home, just try to deal with it until, you know, what is going to come next, what is going to happen. But when I got my papers, I had to leave the place I used to stay in Chadwell Heath and I had to move. And it was the only way to move for the next step. It was the YMCA hostel. It was like in Walthamstow in East London. And I've moved there and my whole life has started from there. So I start learning English. I join like the first course. I start with the basic stuff because I wasn't able to speak English. I like just say like, oh, hi, how are you doing? And I just start using Google Translate. Your English is actually incredible. I know you're living with a, an English family now. I love the fact that we talked about hunky-dory today where we met. I mean, you really have learned some phrases that people don't learn for years and years and years. And speaking to you, it feels like it isn't a second language for you. But when you were in the YMCA, is that where you were watching YouTube and you got your inspiration from US swimmer Michael Phelps? So after start living in the hostel, like it's a new environment for me. I feel like less stress. Like now I've got the papers, everything is good. My English course like going as well. But I remember like there is one night I was just sitting at home by myself and just watching YouTube. And I just came across a video by Michael Phelps. And I didn't even know like who's Michael Phelps. And I remember like, the video started and there was a guy swimming, a lot of butterfly and a lot of different things. And like, he really took me so far away. I mean, like, I remember I was keep watching videos again and again and again. And like, I remember I, I spent like around like two hours just watching what he's doing in his life and how strong and like the way how he just like keep going. I mean, he inspired me so much. He took me to another world like I just thought just talking to myself like in the mirror like in my room and it's just like I'm telling to myself I want to be the new guy who's swimming like Michael Phelps I want to do something with that sport I want to learn how to swim I want to make it to Tokyo I want to go to the Olympic and since that day like the next morning and like eight in the morning I went to the nearest swimming pool I was just like telling the lady oh I've only got five pounds a day is there's any possibility to get a membership or something so it was really hard to pay a membership and go just to swim but after a month of trying to save money from that five pound every day so some days I spend like two pound I save three pound sometimes opposite sometimes I just like I sleep hungry I just want to save that money just to pay the membership and I just went by myself to the pool I went to the water and I pushed the wall and I couldn't even swim two meters. So you'd never learned as a child? Like, if you put me in the water, I just can be like maybe above of the water, but I've never swum like properly. I never like did a freestyle like or any of the other stroke. We, we just like used to go in Syria just to go with the friends chilling in the water, but like nothing more. And how did it feel when you got in the pool, particularly because you came close to drowning on the way over there? There was no fear of the water. Did it just feel amazing to be in the pool? To be honest, when I just like jumped to the water, like I was trying just to focus, like I really want to do it. After like I dive in and I push the wall and I couldn't swim two meters and I do it again and again and again. And it just like I was feeling really frustrated, really angry, like why it's not working? I mean, Michael Phelps, he was doing it like a biscuit. Like it was easy. He was just like flying in the water and... I can't even go two meters. And day after day, I start watching a children in the pool, how they are swimming, go back home, trying to watch on YouTube. I think I have emailed most of the coaches and the swimming clubs in the UK. <laughs> Some of them get back to me and they really offer a free swimming lesson, which is was great. I've learned just the basic stuff, how to do like poppling in the water and like you have to breathe and like, oh wow, that's interesting. And like how just to swim, how is the basic stuff, the stroke and day after day, I mean, my techniques start to begin much better than before. And I remember maybe in six months, 
I was able to do the four stroke, butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke and, and front crawl. And front crawl. <laughs> And I used to watch a swimming group. They used to come every morning in the pool and they were like a bit competitive. They took like the last two lane in the pool and I just like try to come a little bit early around six in the morning and sneak in the third lane. I don't want to bother the coach and the other people, but I was trying to see how they are doing it. Like when the coach say, oh, like three, two, one, like, oh, jump. And like, I just tried to compete with them, but in the third lane. But after a while, the coach noticed that I'm doing something with them. And I just like, oh, oh, that's not cool. And I just <laughs> went to the coach, I think, after a while. And I told him, oh, hi, name. my name is Eid. I'm from Syria. I'm here as a refugee. And I have a dream. And I want to be like the new Michael Phelps. And I've never seen before. And I was just like trying to see what they are doing. And I don't have enough money to have like a proper coach or be uh, a part with a swimming club. Do you have any advice or like any swimming club might help or like do something and actually he he didn't laugh at me he didn't do anything and like he was like really positive and he told me all right then this is interesting he say what about to see you like next thursday morning and like oh my god like yeah sure like i'm in and after that everything start to be different i mean uh, the coach dan who who accepted me with the group and i started to build up and learn the basic stuff and little by little I started to do with them a proper sessions like for one hour and a half and two hours. I remember like maybe after eight months of swimming and learning how just to swim and do all these type of things I enter with a competition. The coach said it's all right just go try to see your time you never had any competition or anything and just let's see how, how you're doing with that. And I remember like coming back home with four medals, like the coach was just shocked. Like, what is that? What happened? <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. And butterfly is a very difficult stroke to learn, isn't it? But I've seen some footage of you doing butterfly. It seems to come very naturally to you. The butterfly is my favorite stroke. Maybe it's not the fastest one, but at the same time, it's my favorite one because all the dream and all the journey started with Michael Phelps and it's his stroke, the butterfly as well. And just for me, just to dive in the water, it just makes me feel like I am in the other world. I mean, you are under the water, there's that silent, you can't really hear anybody if you've got any problem, if you have got anything in your life, in your day, you can just put everything in the water. And when you are just like doing the butterfly with every single stroke, you are just feeling you are free, you're really flying in the water. You are just like putting everything in and it just makes me feel really, really, really happy, re really good. When the pools are open, how many hours a week do you train now? Normally, I do swim with my swimming club twice a day. Like we've got two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. And sometimes like I've got a gym session, like an hour a day or like a running an hour a day. And just like trying to be fit and try my best to achieve the time that the Olympic Society they are asking for. And how close are you to achieving the time that would get you a place in Tokyo next year? So I still have to work a little bit hard. I think there's like around five, six seconds to cut. But I mean, who knows? There is no rules with the swimming. As long as you believe in yourself, as long as you have that passion inside your heart and you really want to do it, nobody can stop you. Just let's go for it. So, Eid, if you managed to get through to the Olympics, it would be with the refugee team, wouldn't it? So, I mean, as a refugee here, I can't compete for England or I can't compete for my country, Syria. So they've created a team it's called the Refugee Team in 2016 in Rio, which is, I think, it's an amazing thing to do. I mean, just to be competing under the flag of the Refugee Team. And for me, just to have that a small opportunity just to be part of it, can't even explain it. I mean, how really makes me happy from inside. And has it worked in your favour in a way that the Olympics have been delayed by a year? There is athletes all around the world. I mean, they have been waiting for four years. So this is really makes like everybody really sad. And I hope like we can do something by the next year. And let's just hope the situation is going to get better for everybody. And if you get in, you're going for gold, aren't you? Uh, this is a really <laughs> big thing. But for me, to be honest, 
to be at the Olympic or just to be competing there, it's not for me, it's not only about a medal, it's not only about a record, it's not only about this type of things. For me, I look at it in a bigger picture. Like for me, just because Michael Phelps, he inspired me so much. I just, I want to do something with that sport. I just want to get a number, get a record. I want to do something like nobody done it before. I mean, who knows? I mean, I believe in myself. I'm going to go there. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to put all the work I have done there. And then we can see how things go. And really, to me, just in the short time I've got to know you, this is about the bigger picture as well, isn't it? This is about the having a dream and going for it. Whatever obstacles are put in your way, you've managed to overcome them and you've overcome greater obstacles than most of us will have to do. I mean, it's who you are, isn't it, Eid? You're determined and you've got a bigger message for people out there, really. I think, to be honest with you, since I left home in Syria, I mean, I know I'm here as a refugee and there is nothing wrong of being a refugee. I had to leave because of the war. Maybe the situation is not easy now. I mean, by building up everything step by step. I mean, language, maybe another refugee in different places, they've just had to learn a harder language than English. Being by yourself, without a family, without a friend, maybe a hard situation, I mean, with the money and the financial thing. But at the same time, let's talk about it in a positive way. Like, okay, I had to leave home and everything, but at the same time, let me build everything by step by step. Um, I really love to look at the things in a positive way. And it doesn't matter what the situation. Like, if you have got a dream, just believe in yourself and go for it. Like, I really wanted to swim. I really wanted to do something about that. Like, I had only five pounds a day for living. But despite all that, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go for it. I mean, maybe people not going to believe in you at the beginning because, like, I'm just like, jumping and saying, I want to do something. I want to go to the Olympic. I'm talking about something really big, like something really crazy. And as I said, people might not believe in you, but at the same time, I believe in myself. I know exactly what I'm going. I know exactly where I'm going for. And keep working hard, even if it's hard, like you're going to fail and you're going to stand up again and you're going to fail again and again and again. But in the end of all the hard work, there is one day like all the hard work will pay off. Not only in swimming, I believe like in everything. I mean, being a teacher, being an accountant, being an engineer, being a doctor, be different, be special. Let's try to work hard and show the whole world around the world. Like we are not only just a refugees. I mean, we are human. We can do a lot of things. We can change the world. I mean, so many people like have been so far with really hard situation. They have made a huge change around the world. Whatever you want to do in your life, you are strong, you are positive, you can do a lot of things. If you are, I mean, English person, a refugee, Arabic, anywhere from around the world, I mean, believe in yourself, believe in your dream and just be different and special. And I believe one day, if you keep thinking with this way, I guarantee you're going to achieve what you want to achieve. That would be a perfect place to end. But I do want to ask how mum and dad feel about your new life in London and, you know, what you've managed to achieve. I'm guessing they're very proud. I think when I just speak with my family and just keep updating them about all the crazy things I'm doing every day, they are really happy. I mean, when I just talk to my mom and dad and just like when they just smile about what I'm doing and just how proud of like, oh, my God, eat doing that. Keep going. This is right keep going it just like make you feel maybe my family is not here oh my god pick that up don't you worry you okay yeah yeah, just that's okay they they just like keep supporting me and eat we are here with you keep going all the hard work you are doing it's amazing and it just like make me feel like really happy really like i'm doing something at the same time I hope, and if they were like around everything, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have to do a lot of things. But when you go back, it's nothing better to have just a conversation with your family and to have a hug with your mom. And like, mom, I've, I've done that. Mom, I got a place at the university. I've done that and that. It's nothing better than to share that with your family in a reality. But at the same time, life is tough. It's not easy. And it just like, I'm happy as long when I'm seeing their smile and 
the way how they just keep supporting me. So I need you happy being an intern here at Convex. So actually just being with Convex, it's just amazing. I mean, it's been now around 10 days and for me, it's like a year, but it's a good year. It's just amazing learning something new every single day. And just like being with that team, it's so great. I mean, all the team, they just want to help. They just want to give you more information. They just want to see you can do that. You can achieve whatever you want to achieve. And everybody very friendly and welcoming with every single step. If you are not sure with, there's all the time people, oh, just please ask, just let me know. Like, I'm free. I can help. I can do all these type of things. You don't really feel like you are at work or something. You feel like with a family, you feel like you are doing something you really enjoy. Well, I know you'll enjoy your internship here at Convex and uh, it does feel like a family here. I'm so glad you've made it, that you're in safe hands. You're around people that care about you and can help and support you. And best of luck with the studying and also for your swimming training. I think what we need to do is find a movie director because your story is worthy of a Hollywood film or, or a novel. Everyone should hear it, Ede. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much for sparing the time today. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to share my story here. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Well, that was Eid al Jazeli sharing his incredible and truly inspirational story of survival. Join me next week for another Convex Conversation. And please do pass the link on to friends and family on your socials. We're at convex.podbean.com or you can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts and on Spotify. So thank you very much for listening. I'll see you soon.